Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tuck Colloquium. Uh, today, we're very happy to have our CNO's very own Henry Wolkowitz, who will tell us about hard combinatorial problems, doubly non-negative relaxations, facial and symmetry reduction, and alternating direction method of multipliers. Henry. Hey. So as uh, you may have noticed on, on here, and I don't know, David, if you invited me on this day in particular, I mean, I don't know if you knew, but uh, today is what we call Rosh Hashanah. So the uh, new year is uh, tonight and it's the year 5,781. So tomorrow is uh, the Jewish new year. So happy new year. And uh, okay. Thank you all for coming. So this is uh, work that I've been doing with uh, mainly, the work that I'm gonna talk about is mainly from this paper that I've been working on with uh, Howe and Renata, both who are here, at least uh, vi virtually here. Renata's in, in the Netherlands. Um, so this paper has uh, been submitted. And also some of the, lately I've been working in this area with several other people. And here's a list of some of the other people that I've been involved with. So what I wanna talk about is looking at how to solve some hard combinatorial, hard discrete optimization problems. And of course, to do that, we need to be able to have efficient upper and lower bounding techniques. Now, these problems are often modeled using quadratic objectives and quadratic constraints. So often these are called QQPs. Now, if you take these quadratic quadratic problems and look at the Lagrangian relaxations, then out pops semi-definite programming. And you get the, what's called the SDP relaxation. And so there's been a lot of work on this, of course. Many people have seen this. And there's a couple of handbooks that are out. And uh, so I've, I've referenced them and they'll be at the end of the, at the last slide. If you wanna see it, the slides will be available and you can see the references there. Okay. So solving these uh, SDP relaxations can be very expensive because they get very large very quickly. And the method of choice for semi-definite programming was interior point methods. This was the method at the beginning. And for a very long time, this essentially was the, pretty well the only way to handle these problems. And what happens is when you start adding cutting planes like non-negativity constraints, then this becomes even more expensive and doubly hard. So the doubly non-negative relaxation when you add extra cutting planes, becomes extra hard for interior point methods because you're essentially taking the cross product of uh, cones. And so interior point methods can be very slow on that problem. So these methods do not scale well for interior point methods. And also, even though theoretically interior point methods work really well, in practice, when you implement them, they have a lot of difficulty in getting high accuracy solutions. So there's a few techniques that people have started using recently, though the uh, interior point methods that, that you can get a, a hold of in practice don't use this yet, but uh, there's a lot of research being done on these, on these techniques. One method to, to reduce the size of the problem is called cordality reduction. And that's, I'm not going to be talking about that. But another few couple of methods are facial reduction, which I'll be talking about, and symmetry reduction. And what's been coming uh, quite popular the last few years is using first order methods for these problems instead of just interior point methods, which are second order methods. So you're hoping to get some sort of splitting maybe of the problem into, into two, two sets of variables and applying something like the AVMM method. 
a splitting method. So facial reduction and symmetry reduction are two of the ways of reducing the size of the problem and also obtaining some regularity. So strict feasibility, so what's interesting is many, uh, many of you, I guess, know is that in optimization, if you have locally Lipschitz functions, your functions are differentiable almost everywhere. So you would think, why worry about non-smoothness? But in practice, when you're optimizing, it seems that invariably you end up at a non-smooth point. And it seems that for many problems here as well, hard combinatorial problems, when you look at semi-definite relaxations, you end up with problems where strict feasibility fails, regularity fails. And one of the ways to at least handle the problem of strict feasibility is using this property of facial reduction. Again, it's, this is uh, started in the 80s, so there's a lot of references at the end of the paper. So this problem both obtains regularity for the problem, but also reduces the size of the problem by reducing the dimension of the problem. Another approach is symmetry reduction. So started by Shriver, and there's a bunch of references over here as well at the end of the paper. And this is used to obtain a block diagonal form for the problems that are in for problems which originally have special structure, namely they're invariant under the action of a symmetry group. Essentially, the problem can then be restricted to a matrix star algebra that contains the data matrices. And then after a rotation, we end up getting a block diagonal, simplified, smaller, reduced problem. So this approach will give you a, often a much, much smaller problem. And what we're trying to do, of course, is combine it with FR, facial reduction. So what we'd like to do is take facial reduction and symmetric reduction, put them together. So we have the benefits of both, getting a smaller problem, a regularized problem, and, what and we, want to apply, uh, we want to apply some sort of splitting methods. And in this case, we're going to be applying the ADMM approach after doing these two reductions. So the paper that I referenced at the beginning with Hal and Renata, we apply this to several problems, but the problem today that I'm going to look at is the quadratic assignment problem. So please, uh, David, if anybody asks a question, maybe you can tell me. Yes, we'll do. Okay. So I've uh, talked about the QAP before. I'm sure many of you know it, so I'll just run through it quickly. So the QAP, the quadratic assignment problem, involves two symmetric matrices for data and using the trace inner product in the matrix space. And it's a problem over permutations. And we realize the permutations of the integers one to n using permutation matrices, n by n permutation matrices. One of the nice ways of visualizing this problem is by thinking about the facility location problem, assigning n facilities to n locations, we want to minimize total cost. So what we do is we have a flow between two facilities that we don't know where to put them yet. And once we decide where to put them, there's a distance between the two locations. So therefore we get a total cost, namely the distance times the number of in the flow. So there's a quadratic property to this problem. And then we also have, though I'm not gonna treat it after this slide, we also have a location cost. So there's a location cost of putting a certain facility into a location. So you can use the trace formulation for this problem. And this is what it looks like. It's an inner product of X with this matrix product. And the inner product is the trace inner product. So we essentially just take this matrix product 
and we multiply it with x transpose. And this is our objective function. And we're trying to find the best permutation, which is realized by the best permutation matrix. OK. So what's interesting is how many applications there are for this, for this model. Univers designing universities from scratch, where to put buildings, because there's a flow between buildings. You want to put the uh, math building near the, near the math library, et cetera, but not what's so worried about maybe near the swimming pool. There's hospital layouts, airports. What, and what's interesting is that this is a very important subproblem in VLSI design in designing circuit boards for computer chips. And you can see a list of other problems. Molecular conformation is done this way as well. Protein, talking about problems related to protein folding, subproblems in protein folding are done using this model. And these two problems are special cases. So this is an NPR problem. So, we're talking about permutation matrices. So permutation matrices have exactly one, one, one in each row and one, one in each column. So the row sums are one, the column sums are one. So E is the vector of ones. So when we multiply X times E, those are the row sums, we get one. We take the transpose, we get the column sums, and it has to be non-negative. So these are doubly stochastic matrices. And we can take the row and column sums and turn them using this by taking uh, quadratic norms. We can turn them into these constraints over here. Permutation matrices are orthogonal. When we do XX transpose and X transpose X, we get the identity. And what's interesting for these problems is that doubling these constraints helps in the relaxation. As well, we have this thing called the gangster constraints, which essentially means that the rows and the columns of the permutation matrices are Hadamard orthogonal. So that's the, what these relationships state. And we have the zero one constraints. So Xij squared minus Xij equals zero and non-negativity. So clearly a lot of these constraints are redundant. It's interesting is we can take the Lagrangian relaxation of this, as I mentioned, and out pops an SDP. And the SDP of the, of the Lagrangian dual gives us what's called the, Lagrangian, the SDP relaxation of this problem. But as, I'm, as we were discussing strict feasibility, Slater's condition fails. There's a different formulation where you don't have to add so many constraints. There's a minimal number of constraints and still get the same relaxation. This is sort of an explicit way of showing this linearization, this lifting to a matrix Y in this higher dimensional space. And this is the Xij times the Xst. These are equal to zero. So this represents how we can see that this gangster operator represents zeros in the, in the big matrix Y. Okay, so this is the explicit form for the lifting. So we take the matrix X and we do what MATLAB does, stores it column-wise as a vector. All matrices in MATLAB are stored column-wise. I'm just, I guess, programs in general. So X is VEC of X, column-wise, and then we take the matrix Y, formed from the outer product of these two vectors. This gives us a semi-definite matrix, and this is the size of the matrix. And we block it in this way. So this is the first column of the matrix Y. We have Y bar here, and we have these N by N blocks inside of Y bar. The objective function, which is trace of A, I'm just throwing away the location costs. The objective function is the trace of AXPX transpose. 
and it can be written in this way using the Kronecker product. This is a very well-known property of, uh, of the Kronecker product. Okay, so the, there's a lot of interesting constraints that come up from the, the lifting. One is the zero one constraint can be realized using this thing called the arrow constraint, which says take the diagonal of the matrix, subtract the first column. That essentially the diagonal is the square of elements and the first column is a one times an element. So this essentially represents the zero one constraint. So the arrow constraint is a realization of the zero one constraint. So there's many, and we can also look at the doubly non-negative constraint adding on y non-negative. And we could also add on less or equal to one if we want to. With any questions at all? So there's a lot of other constraints that arise using the formulation we've been talking about. This comes out also another realization from the, using the Kronecker product. These matrices are positive semi-definite. And because they're positive semi-definite, then any feasible Y is positive semi-definite. Then the constraint says that this product has to be zero. This tells us, this is a reason, an explanation that tells us that the matrix Y cannot be positive definite and explains why we lose strict feasibility. We lose Slater's condition. And it also gives us a way of doing what's called facial reduction. So the V here will come from these matrix D and I'll explain this more carefully further down in the talk. These are some other interesting constraints that come up. Sort of really elegant constraints. This is the, the matrix of traces. This gives you an identity matrix. The sum of the diagonals of the diagonal blocks gives you, gives you all ones. And the sum of off diagonal elements will give you this matrix here, which is zero on the diagonal and ones off the, the diagonal. Okay, I mentioned the gangster constraints. I just want to mention some notation here. This is just for the purpose of notation. I mentioned the gangster constraints is really the Hadamard orthogonal rows and Hadamard orthogonal columns. So this is representing Hadamard orthogonal rows. When i is not equal to j, j, this is equal to zero. And then if we look at the position in the matrix in the big matrix y, we end up getting a zero. So this index is in this index set H. So this gangster constraint, the gangster constraint, it's called the gangster constraint because it shoots holes in the matrix, shoots zeros in the matrix. And uh, this is, uh, the name is, uh, came up by uh, Philip Twant, was the first to use that. And so it just says, when you pick these elements of the matrix Y, they have to be zero. And now we can see what the final SDP relaxation looks like. It has a lot of constraints. These are the constraints that give rise to facial reduction. There's the arrow that I mentioned. There's the gangster. The top left element has to be one. These are those extra nice trace diagonal constraints over here. And Y has to be positive semi-definite. I have not added non-negativity, so this is not the doubly non-negative. This is just the STP relaxation. A lot of constraints. And one of the interesting things is that when you do facial reduction here, when you replace the Y with this smaller matrix R using this substitution, 
all these constraints become redundant. The only thing left is the gangster constraint, and R has to be semi-definite. So everything gets simplified, which of course is a really, really nice surprise and makes this very, very nice for semi-definite programming. So one of the things that's nice about this problem is that the dual, so this problem now satisfies trick feasibility. The dual of this satisfies trick feasibility. And the dual of the dual gives you this problem back. And so for some of you who've worked with primal dual interior point methods, this is perfect for applying primal dual interior point approaches to. You've got a primal problem and a dual problem, and both satisfy strict feasibility. You can talk about interior point methods. Now, the other thing, as I mentioned, that's nice about the phase reduction is Y equals VRV transpose, this structure. This appears to provide a natural splitting for the problem. Now, uh, we've been working uh, on this with the people I mentioned, and we don't totally understand exactly why, why this works so well. Somehow it seems that the more of a facial reduction you have, the more of a matrix V that you have, more complicated matrix V that you have, the better the splitting seems to be. So what does the splitting mean? It means that all the polyhedral constraints go on the matrix Y, the big matrix Y. And hopefully those are simple, namely just non-negativity, just putting some elements into zero, namely the gangster. That's exactly what happens. Really trivial constraints go on to Y. So that's represented by this polyhedral set. And then what goes on to R is just a projection onto the semi-definite column. So this is the Eckert-Young theorem. All you have to do is do a spectral decomposition, throw away the negative eigenvalues, and you have the projection on the semi-definite cone. So you have two simple problems that you can bounce between. And this provides a splitting of the problem. And this is a natural fitting for the ADMM approach. Okay. So uh, some of the things I've mentioned are written over here. So the facial reduction gives us a reduction in dimension and, uh, and also rank, natural reduction in the rank of the problem, reduction in the matrix that we're looking at. Okay, and, and, and this natural splitting. Okay, symmetry reduction. So I'll ask uh, how and Renata, if they'll be so kind, if I make a mistake, to please raise their hand. So I've learned a lot here from them. I uh, was not an expert at all in this area, but I think it's uh, just really an amazing, beautiful area. So when Etienne was here, Etienne de Klerk, quite a few years ago, he worked in this area to solve some problems in our department. Um, so I got a little taste back then, but not a lot. I know Levent works on this as well. Uh, <clears throat> so what's involved here? So we have a primal problem and a dual problem. And the data for the problem, this is a general STP. So we have uh, matrices AI involved in the data and also the C involved in the data. And we, again, we'd like to somehow exploit the structure to reduce the size of the problem. So we want to do a substitution, just like what's interesting, and this is why we use this notation, the star. What's interesting for the facial reduction is we use V star, and you'll see it coming up again, as a substitution, the VRV transpose, to reduce the problem. Now we want to find a substitution to find a reduction here. So we're going to do this work. We're going to use this work from Schreiber to find problem to exploit problems which are invariant under the action of the symmetry group, and we're going to use the artan weddenbury theory to be able to reduce to block reduce the problem. 
and use the problem to plot diagonal structure. Okay, so let's start. So we need a, a non-trivial group of permutation matrices. <coughs> <coughs> so it's really interesting to me, of course, not to all of you, so ma many of you, but I, I look, take a look at the literature in the 60s and the 70s in optimization, and nobody was using semi-definite programming. In fact, the first talk I gave in semi-definite programming was, was at a SIAM conference. And as I left the podium, the speaker coming after me, his comment was essentially a joke about semi-definite programming. Now I'll talk about something real. As they started talking about conjugate gradient methods, quasi-Newton methods, etc. So it's a, quite amazing how optimization has really combined with algebra and, uh, co and a lot of convex analysis and developed some really sophisticated theory. It's really, really changed since I started. Okay, so we're gonna start with a group of permutation matrices of size n, and we get this commutant or the, what's called the centralizer ring of G. And here it's, what is it, this definition. Essentially, it's the set of all square matrices X that commute with all the permutation matrices in the centralizer. And equivalently, you can prove that this is the image under this Reynolds operator. The Reynolds operator is an orthogonal projection onto the commutant. So it's also called the group average and here's the definition. It's one over the cardinality of the group. And you take the summation using all the permutations under, this, under these congruences. Okay. Now this commutant is a matrix star algebra. So it's closed under addition, scalar multiplication, and matrix multiplication, and taking transposes as well. Of course, I'm talking about transposes because for us, we're talking about real problems, orthogonal projections. In the literature, this is all done for complex with unitary matrices. And uh, so it's a little bit different. Now, the thing about this problem is you can find a basis for the centralizer. And this is how you do it from the orbits of the action of the group on the ordered vertices. On, under the of the of these of this set, okay. under the action of the group, you get a basis for the centralizer, and this basis is denoted b1 to bd, and we will always assume that this basis has this property. In other words, we have this coherent configuration. J is the matrix of ones, and it satisfies these three properties. Okay. Namely, the there is, you can always sum to the matrix of ones. The identity is here and the transposes are here. And when you take this product, it's in the span. Okay. So I mentioned Etienne and uh, we're actually gonna use one of his theorems here. And that is that, uh, um, that the centralizer let the AG denote the matrix star algebra, but specifically one that contains the data matrices, the AI and the C of an SDP problem, as well as the identity. And if it has an optimal solution, then you can assume that the optimal solution is in the centralizer ring. What does that do for us? Now, when we were reducing using facial reduction, we didn't, what we were trying to do is get into a smaller dimensional space, but we did not change the feasible set. We essentially restricted ourselves to the face of the semi-definite cone, but still the feasible set stayed the same, though it was in a smaller dimension because we were able to reduce dimension by staying in smaller dimensional faces. But here we can actually reduce the feasible set. We do not have to consider the whole feasible set which is a big surprise. First time I saw this, I was very surprised. And you can do that, but the optimal solution doesn't change. Okay, so we can restrict ourselves 
to the facial to the feasible set intersect the centralizer. And so we can assume that all feasible points, because we're in the centralizer, can be written using this new basis. And so we can write it as B star of X, a linear transformation of little x. And X is just a vector, a d-dimensional vector. So B star of X maps into the original feasible set. But the point is that if D is small, little d is small, that of course is the major point, the basis is small, the bigger the permutation group, the smaller the basis, then we have reduced the problem dramatically. Okay. No questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, we assume that uh, the matrix, the permutation matrices is uh, uh, small enough, but it contains the data um, so that we can uh, reduce the problem. So that the feasible set gets reduced so that we can get a smaller basis. Okay. And so this is our first reduced symmetric reduced problem. And uh, B is B star star, the adjoint of B star. And so using the inner product property of adjoints, we can move B onto C. And we have this new symmetric reduced problem. This is acting on a vector. So A composition B star has to be a matrix acting on a vector. And B star of X is in our original feasible set and it has to be semi-definite. Okay, so this is a smaller feasible set, but the optimal solution has not changed. And what's really interesting in the problem is that we work with, because we want to be able to apply the doubly non-negative structure, we can replace this being non-negative, this, this symmetric matrix here, with the vector being non-negative. So that's going to be a big plus as well. Okay. So now M is called basic if M can be written as a direct sum of these of matrices in this way, this matrix M. And so this theorem of Wedderburn says if we have a matrix star algebra obtaining the identity, there is a unitary matrix we will be using orthogonal so that when we look at this congruence here, the rotation in matrix space, then it's a direct sum of ba basic matrix star algebras. And that's going to give us our reduction. Right? So we're going to use, instead of unitary, we use orthogonal matrices. We're going to get T blocks. So we get this orthogonal matrix Q. And we end up doing this or rotation of X, congruence of X, and we get this block diagonalization. And this is what it looks like over here. Okay. So we have this block, and each one of these, each B I star over here, is described over here using basis matrices. So each one of these has a basis. And hopefully it's small, because that's what's going to make our problem accessible and tractable. Okay. So again, just like facial reduction, all it is, is it ends up being a substitution. We're going to take all the matrices X in our original space and do this substitution. And it ends up being back in the original space. Okay. But we're going to be able to restrict ourselves to the centralizer at the same time. Okay, so this ends up being our block diagonal problem. Again, we use the property of the adjoint. We're acting on a vector, so this has to be a matrix. So this composition here is this matrix A. This is block diagonal structure, so hopefully this can be done very cheaply, finding this is semi-definite. We want this to be non-negative as well, and that transfers to little x being non-negative. 
So fx is now our original feasible set. And sx is called the slacks for the problem. So these are these semi-definite matrices that we need to be semi-definite to be uh, to be that, to have this new symmetric reduced problem. And of course, the magic is that this problem is block diagonal. Now, what are we hoping? We're hoping that the number of blocks is much smaller than uh, the triangular number over here, so number of variables. And this is much smaller than the original number of variables for the original matrix. So the original size matrix is size n. So we're hoping we've reduced the problem significantly. Okay, so our main approach was trying to do this symmetric reduction, but then saying, well, what happens if this problem is not stable? This problem does not satisfy Slater's condition. What can we do? Well, we'd like to apply facial reduction to this symmetric reduced problem. How do we do that? Now, you can go ahead and say, well, we know how to do facial reduction. Why not just do facial reduction? Well, the reason facial reduction has been successful in many discrete optimization problems is because we can exploit the explicit structure of the original problem. If we forget the explicit structure of the original problem, then it's a very hard problem to apply blindly a facial reduction algorithm. In fact, after one, the first step can be successful, but the second step so far has not been that successful in terms of getting a robust algorithm for facially reduced problems that where you need two or more steps. So here's a couple of properties that we're gonna be able to take advantage of. If we take a look at the maximum rank of all feasible points, it's the same as the maximum rank of all points in the relative interior of the feasible set. And it's the same, as you can see, in the relative interior of the minimal face containing the feasible set. So this is a standard property that's known. And the notation is that the face f of x is the minimal face of the semi-definite cone containing the feasible set. Okay. Now, um, then we have this little interesting theorem. It's not hard to prove. It sort of follows from the things that we've looked at and this rank condition. If we look at the maximum rank over all the feasible points, then it's the same as the maximal rank of the image under the Reynolds operator, under the orthogonal projection. And it's the same as the maximal rank of all x in the centralizer and intersected the feasible set. And it's the same if we looked at all the slacks. Okay. So it's the same as all the slacks, feasible slacks. Okay. So the maximum rank for this is always the same. And that's going to help us. Why? Because the trick, the key for us, is using exposing vectors for facial reduction. So facial reduction can be done in many ways. And originally, the approach was not looking at what's called exposing vectors. Okay, so this first paragraph here is just a summary of what I've been saying and what's what we said before. And but we want to implement both together. And that the key is using exposing vectors. So what's an exposing vector? So W is an exposing ve vector written in this uh, product of two matrices form. Exposing vector of the minimal face. If you take any feasible point, the trace of W times X has to be zero. And we always assume that U is full column rank. And, if, and, and, and the V corresponding to the U satisfies this property. So the range, range of V gives us the null space of few transpose. So as I mentioned to you, that substitution that we're going to find, 
substitution here is going to be V star of R given by VRV transpose that we looked at before. As soon as we have this substitution using this V, we can substitute for X, move things over using the adjoint property, and we get a, pro a smaller problem in R. So this is called facial reduction. Each step of facial reduction reduces our problem in dimension, okay? because we're assuming that W is not zero. And so if it reduces the problem in dimension, it has at most n minus one steps. And because we can prove, just recently proved in Stefan Suramak's thesis actually, and in a paper with me, that at every step of facial reduction, you lose one constraint, at least one constraint becomes redundant. And so it takes at most m steps. So it's the minimum of these two steps to do facial reduction. Okay. So then we have this, this lemma that we can take advantage of. If we have an exposing vector for the, for the feasible set, then you can find an exposing vector in the centralizer. And the rank is going to be at least as big. Okay, and here's the proof. Again, the proof just uses properties of the adjoint. If we have an exposing vector, it has to be semi-definite and has to have this property, has to be zero for all feasibles X when you take this inner product. Now, since the original problem is G invariant, so we know that each one of these is still in the feasible set for every permutation in the group. We conclude that when we take this inner product, we can move the P's onto the W. And that's exactly what we want. We want this to be zero. And this is still our thought, not semi-definite, because the congruence of a semi-definite matrix is always semi-definite. And so we get an exposing vector when we take the summation of all of these using the Reynolds operator, that's still an exposing vector. And since the rank cannot decrease when you add symmetric matrices, the rank will be at least D when you take this summation. So that's the proof. Okay, so I'm running uh, a little bit uh, slow. I thought I'd... Okay, so, so using the, these properties, uh, we're able to get the reduced symmetric problem, which is also facially reduced. So this ends up being the problem that we're gonna apply uh, our approach to. Okay. One of the interesting things that also that came up while we're looking at this is singularity degree. For some of you who've looked at singularity degree, it's one of the interesting things in semi-definite programming. One of the things that's hiding and telling you how hard a semi-definite program is because it provides a holder error bound. This is a result of Sturm in 2000. So you, there's a nice singularity degree relationship between the uh, facially reduced semi-definite problem and the symmetric reduced semi-definite problem. Okay, so uh, I would like to just show how to apply the augmented method of multipliers. So the key is to take the semi-definite problem and divide it into two parts. So we're going to divide it into the uh, semi-definite part, which we mentioned here for the R, and, and divide it here for the polyhedral part. And being able to divide this into two parts allows us to use this augmented Lagrangian approach. So all we have to, um, we can split the problem into two. So first we're gonna solve the problem for X in the set P, and then we're gonna solve the problem for R, which has to be semi-definite. And the dual here is the dual variable. So this is the augmented Lagrangian for the uh, semi-definite relaxation. 
And what the, these augmented Lagrangian methods do is they alternate between solving for X and solving for R. This is called the splitting methods. This is why it ends up being so efficient. Each of these methods end up being really trivial, really cheap. And then you do a dual update. And uh, just repeat. So you, typically, you can end up doing thousands of these iterations, but they're so fast, so cheap, that you can still do them. And you hopefully get convergence. OK, so I'm not, I don't have time to, uh, to show you how to do those two steps. I just want to impress you with uh, some of the numerical results. So we worked on a, one of the fancy computers we have here at Waterloo in uh, Big Linux, or was it Fast Linux? I forget. I guess it was Big Linux. Um, so we're solving these really huge problems. So we have these uh, essentially 10 to the eighth non-negative variables in these problems. So here's uh, the table with the big problems. So this is uh, comparing, so this is our ADMM approach over here. And uh, this is uh, upper, upper bounds known in the literature, and this is lower bounds from the literature. This is a paper from uh, uh, 2010. And, uh, and this is the time that uh, they've taken. But as you can see, for these big problems, because they used interior point methods, they couldn't start working on those big problems. But uh, we were successfully solved all these, all these problems. We get an upper bound here under the OBJ value. We get lower bounds over here. These are the times, and this is the residual, which indicates where we stop iterating. Okay. So we did not stop early, but we have a trick which allows us to find uh, lower bounds and upper bounds. And you can see that we've, uh, so getting a bigger number here means we've improved on lower bounds in the literature. These numbers are significantly bigger. And of course here, they haven't been able to uh, solve these problems. So uh, this is, how could that we're able to do that? Same with these big problems here and these big problems down here. And here's another uh, class of problems, I don't know. <clears throat> so when I've uh, presented talks like this before, the audience in the room at the back would say, we can't see those numbers. But here you guys can't cheat, right? Because you're seeing the same screen I am. So my one little joke of my whole, of the whole talk, you can see these numbers if you're still there. Okay, conclusion. We discussed strategies for finding new strengthened lower and upper bounds for these really huge discrete optimization problems. And we used these, uh, we used these huge W non-negative relaxations. In particular, what we did was our contribution was we combined facial reduction and semi-definite reduction, symmetric reduction efficiently. So at least that's what uh, we think we've done. And we have obtained a regularized problem which we drastically reduced the size of the dimension of the problem and the size of the problem. And we were able to exploit the na a natural splitting which arises from facial reduction. Uh, and so this natural splitting allows us to do this ADMM approach to the first order method so we can actually tackle these problems where interior point methods have a really hard time. And we also provided some interesting results on singularity degree and rank preservation. So here are some of the uh, references that I mentioned, but uh, 
I'm obviously not going to. So the talk, those numbers that I mentioned were taken from this paper, Middleman and Peng, for the first table. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to stay around and happy to celebrate the new year with you. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, so uh, at this point, if you have a question for Henry, please uh, unmute and just go ahead and ask. You know, I, I'll ask a question. This is probably obvious to the experts, but maybe for us non-experts, could you say a little more about these? You took these specific problems, I guess they're standard problems from these other papers. Could you say a little more about them, about what they actually are? Yeah. Um, so a lot of them have some uh, very special structure. Um, some of them have uh, these things called the Manhattan distances for the QAP. And this is what allows allows one to do to to get this uh, these reductions. Um, yeah. So, and there's also this uh, I forget right off the top of my head this other this other group of uh, of problems which um, we have in the paper. Uh, let's see, maybe Hal or Renata, you want to mention the major example that we have here? So we were looking at the hello. So we were looking at Hamming distances and Manhattan distances, mostly. Yeah. So here, I don't know if you can see. If you can see this. Or I can cheat and take this example. So we're looking at these Hamming graphs as the algebra behind behind the uh, problem, where where the weights come from. Do you want to say anything more about this, um, Renata? Uh, yeah. So so the the first group of instances they have a Manhattan distances, and second one has a, a coming from the Hamming graphs. So the Hamming graphs are well studied graphs. So essentially, uh, to obtain this block diagonalization, we exactly knew how the uh, block diagonal matrix, how these uh, orthogonal matrices are looking. Um, so um, everything is known about Hamming graphs. I, I guess many of you know a lot about Hamming graphs. Yeah. So I think maybe that's one of the things that that is the contribution here is that we, because it, what we were worried that if you did symmetry reduction you wouldn't be able to apply facial reduction because you would destroy, because for example, for QAP, we know that the underlying ground set provides the structure to do the facial reduction. So those matrices D that I had gave us the exact explicit structure to find these matrices V to do this facial reduction. So you would may not be able to do it. But, and then if you did facial reduction, then we would destroy the structure for these, these Hamming graphs. We wouldn't be able to do the symmetric reduction, right? So the key was being able to do both together. And I think the key was having these results about exposing vectors. Because the exposing vector for the facial reduction, essentially taking the, the, per, the orthogonal permutation, the Reynolds operator did not change anything, we ended up with a straightforward exposing vector for this, this symmetric reduced problem. So we had all the structure still there. And so it was trivial then to get facial reduction done. We didn't lose any of the structure front. The structure was up, not lost uh, from the uh, uh, symmetric reduction. So I don't know how, do you want to contribute anything to that or Renata, more to that? Yeah, I think that sounds okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question, if there is one. Uh, 
If not, um, let's thank Henry again. And uh, at this point, uh, we can move to the, uh, the virtual grad house.